Madison staff, it's great to have you. I hope you had a great day yesterday. Thank you so much for such a positive day. I, I really, I went home last night really pumped up. I also had the real distinct honor and privilege last night of having dinner with Dr. Brooks, who we're gonna, I'm gonna invite up in a second. Uh, but before I do, I just wanted to speak a little bit to uh, some of who Dr. Brooks is and why he's here. Uh, when we were trying to identify, it was important to me that, that we highlighted this year by bringing in someone special to make our, our team uh, recognize the extent to which we value expertise in the field and we desire and aspire to make sure that our staff is the best supported and best educated staff out there. And whereas many of you no doubt engage in your own professional learning and professional development, we also want to facilitate as much as possible your access to some of the best minds in education. However, we did not want to bring in just some other educational expert to talk at us about what they think education is or should be. Rather, we wanted to find someone who had true expertise in a field that we all wanted to know more about. And throughout last year, one of uh, the, probably the most salient topic that I heard from both parents, our Board of Education, all of our staff, students, as well as the administrators, was the concept of student wellness. And I will share right now with the Board of Education, we had a goal setting session, and we've been talking about student wellness, and the Board of Education has expressed a real interest in pursuing the goal, specifically in the direction of wellness, in the direction of whole child thinking. I spoke about that yesterday, and uh, we spoke about it a lot with Dr. Brooks last night, and that's uh, something that we all really have unanimity around, that we are here to support the whole child. And Dr. Brooks is absolutely, in my opinion so far, that I've ever met, or, or, or whose work I've ever read, is, has got his finger on the pulse of exactly what it means to educate the whole child. That said, I just want to speak a little bit to Dr. Brooks's credentials because they are pretty impressive. So, in addition to consulting in a variety of capacities for PBS um, and uh, actually Sesame Street Parenting Magazine, um, Dr. Brooks has his doctorate in clinical psychology from Clark University. Uh, he also um, did additional training at the University of Colorado Medical School. He's on the faculty of Harvard Medical School. He's, uh, he, uh, he served as the director of the Department of Psychology of McLean Hospital, a private psychiatric hospital, um, specifically where he worked as the principal of a, of a psychiatric school, in which he worked in the locked door unit of the program. Uh, he's received a variety of awards, including the gubernatorial award for distinguished public service for his work with the Governor's Alliance Against Drugs. Uh, it, as part of his contribution alliance, he co-authored a pamphlet for parents talking about children and adolescents about drugs. He's also received the Hall of Fame Award from the Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Disorders uh, Organization and the uh, Connecticut Association for Children with Learning Disabilities. Um, there's a ton of other accolades that he has on here, but suffice to say, he's written 17 books. Um, and one of the most important uh, features that I've noticed working with Dr. Brooks and speaking with him is specifically that not only is he focused on just wellness, but he really has this, this underlying theme, and you'll see it in the titles of his works, and we'll send you his, his bio so you can connect with it. I mean, you've already seen his website. But he really focuses tremendously on the topic of resilience. And so often in schools, we focus on wellness as the idea we want to take pressure off of kids. And whereas there are some circumstances where no doubt we want to do that for sure, if the pressure is, is excessive. However, more importantly, we want our students to become resilient in the face of pressure. And that when they're faced with stress, that they interpret it as good stress, use stress, in a way that they get excited about that stress and they become up for the challenge to become successful. We do have a stressful world in front of them and in front of all of us. And we want our children to be resilient, challenged, and supported. And Dr. Brooks is here today to talk about that. So I'm gonna, skip. before I hand it over to him, hold on, I'm gonna definitely, definitely give him a nice applause. I wanna invite everybody, Dr. Brooks is very actually tech savvy. I'm a little envious because I've been, I aspire to be more of a, more of a, a social media Twitter guy myself. But he's very good with that. So in the spirit of, I know many of us have been getting really into social media, particularly Twitter for professional growth, we're gonna use a, a, a hashtag uh, Twitter chat today, and it's gonna be MPS whole child. I emailed that to you if you wanna see it, but it's a hashtag MPS whole child, and we wanna invite you to, throughout the presentation, if there's anything that Dr. Brooks says, you wanna use that hashtag and throw out a tweet, everybody here can search that hashtag and see what your tweet, your quote is, and I gotta tell you, he drops knowledge bombs all over the place. Last night he dropped several on me and I was like, hold on, I gotta, I gotta write that down. So if you get any of those today, please throw it out there with a the tweet and then throughout the day we can all respond. And Dr. Brooks, I know if you're, if, would, would love to be able to retweet some of your tweets so that way the people that follow him, and he has quite a few followers, can see the work that he's doing here with us. So without any further ado, I wanna thank everybody here for coming. I wanna remind everybody that we have representation from our entire faculty here, and we're going to, uh, to make sure that Dr. Brooks is able to speak to everyone. So thank you very much, Dr. Brooks, please come on up. Come around and applause.
he just made me so anxious by saying I was tech savvy. <laughs> well, I want to thank uh, Dan for really uh, recommending me here. And I just want to say last night, I told Mark this. First of all, based on what Mark said, I think I'm going to be speaking to the converted choir today. And the best compliment you could pay me uh, at the end of this is really saying it's validating a lot of what we're already doing. And uh, really, Mark, uh, it was such a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you and meet you and hear all that's going on uh, here. Um, with that said, tech savvy, I just started using a computer. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I want to do today uh, is to share with you a 40-year career. The years go by very quickly. Uh, as a uh, psychologist, a teacher, a principal, in really looking at some of what Mark mentioned as we educate and raise kids in today's world, what are some of the most important things that we can be really thinking about and looking about. And a lot of what I say about the kids, it really has a lot to do with our own well-being as well. Uh, before I leave this uh, first slide and get into some of the content, just to let you know, some of you know already because Mark had mentioned uh, my website, I write a monthly article on my website for parents, teachers, mental health professionals, youth coaches. I think everything I'm going to discuss today you'll find brief for articles. Uh, it is totally free to subscribe. There's now about 180 articles I've been writing since uh, probably 1999. If you are, can find a certain article, just email me. Uh, it may be under a certain title that doesn't seem quite as clear. By the way, I do like to tell people though, when I went to get a website address many years ago, I typed in as my URL, Robert Brooks, it's my name. Have any of you ever tried to get an email address and it comes back and it says it's already taken? Oh, a few of you. I was so <coughs> young and naive, I, I put in Robert Brooks, I get this message back, your name is taken. And I remember I said, who took it? It's like identity theft. And Robert Brooks is a common enough name, but I said, I really should check who was the Robert Brooks that beat me to this? I guess I should have known. I'm a very big sports fan, and there used to be a wonderful player in the National Football League on the Green Bay Packers whose name is Robert Brooks. The other Robert Brooks is a very handsome, muscular, African-American man who is also a gospel singer. If you do not type in Dr. but just robertbrooks.com, you will go to his homepage where he appears without a shirt on, <laughs> muscles bulging, singing gospel, which I thought was, don't do it here, please. <laughs> which I thought was ca kind of neat till someone wrote to me and said, you look so much better on your website than a real life. So, uh, the reason I started to tweet, uh, my older son, Rich, who lives in the Portland, Maine area, his whole field is social media. He's actually gone into a couple of high schools in Portland and worked with kids and the faculty about setting up social media clubs. So he came to me a number of years ago, he said there's this thing called Twitter, and you should be on it. So he set it up, I didn't know what to do. And then he came to me three months later and he said, most people tweet more than once every three months. I didn't even remember tweeting once, but maybe he was being nice. So I must tell you this, I love when my sons and daughters-in-law, have any of you done this? I mean, it's not that, it's terrible. You go to a restaurant and you take a photo of the meal, and then you tweet it out, like, so, I'll get these tweets, having a delicious meal. And I'll say, who the hell cares? I'm not there. <laughs> so, I don't do that. Well, last night's meal was delicious, really. Um, I, I, I don't do that, but um, about two or three times a week, if you are on Twitter, I, I will tweet a link to an article, a lot having to do with our own social and emotional well-being and about education, just briefer articles. I am up to seven followers. So after today, a few more than that over the years. Anyway, it's my way of saying as I'm introducing this, uh, you know, when you have a 40-year career and you have a couple of hours to share some of it, there's still a lot of things you can share, but you'll find a lot of resources uh, on my website. So let me start by uh, telling you about an article I read on my website, um, uh, it, it, had, uh, it, it had to do with one of the most powerful commencement speeches I ever heard. I was not there. Uh, some, it's on YouTube. What, what is it on YouTube these days? 
Uh, it was Stephen Jobs' commencement speech at Stanford University. Uh, some of you may know about, uh, you know, have heard it. And there is a lot in there that I could discuss, but I want to, especially you'll see why, I want to talk about one key point he made in that commencement speech, which really triggered so many thoughts and feelings in me. In that speech, Stephen Jobs said, in our lives, we often try to connect the dots going forwards. And that's very important. We say if we do this, it will lead to this, it will lead to this. We help our students do that, plan for this, how to do a term paper. But what he says is, what may be much more important as we look at our overall lives, is not to connect the dots going forwards, is really to connect the dots going backwards. And what he meant by that is, and I'll make this very personal for the group here and myself, in the next five, six months, every one of us in this room, we're gonna have certain experiences. We're gonna have experiences with particular students. We're gonna have experiences as colleagues together. We're in our personal lives, we're gonna have certain experiences. At the time, they may seem important, but they may not. But I will tell you this, five years from now, you're gonna look back and you're gonna say, if this had not occurred, if I had not met this student, if I had not met this colleague, I would not be where I am today. And the reason I bring this up, it may seem very simple is, I'm gonna say this, and you'll hear more about this. Every comment you make to a student this year, every comment you may make to a colleague, they, 20, 30 years ago, based on research, they are gonna remember certain <coughs> things, and it's gonna have a major impact on their life. So my talks are always very personal, I think they should be. Uh, so I want to tell you about a teacher I had, and I, probably I would not be here today if he had not come into my life. I grew up in uh, Brooklyn, anyone here from Brooklyn? Oh, I knew it was a classy audience. <laughs> uh, and I, I did my undergraduate uh, degree at the City College of New York. Uh, Psychology was my third major in college. Uh, as an upper junior, I took my first psychology class. And uh, the, probably the only reason I took a psychology class is my advisor advised me that I needed another class in the social sciences. So how do you pick a class? Some of you may remember as an undergraduate, I don't know if it was true where you went. You picked a class that fit into your schedule and was not already full. So I picked a class and I was very fortunate because the professor in that class, his name was John Bauer. I had heard very nice things about John Bauer. And, you know, one of the things was, and I remember this as if it were yesterday, the moment I took his class, I'd say within 10 minutes I knew something. And some of you may have known this about teachers or professors you had. Within 10 minutes I had this real sense about a couple of things. One, he loved the subject he was teaching. And let me tell you, introductory psych is not exciting. I often think introductory psych was introduced to dissuade people from majoring in psychology on that. And you know what else I realized? This is just meeting him for 10 minutes or so. I knew he loved students. There was just something about him, a certain warmth. So I said, well, this should be a fun class. Well, at the end of the, that semester, now I'm finished with my junior year, um, I realized something. I was not happy with my business major, and I just fell in love with psychology, but I was really, and I'm going to this in detail to show you the impacts on it, I was saying maybe it was just Dr. Bauer, maybe it's the subject matter, maybe it's a combination, and if I switch majors now, I will have to stay in college longer than four years. By the way, nowadays, that seems par for the course, but when I went, actually some people graduated in four years. So, uh, the good news was City College at that point was tuition free. So, you know, your parents didn't say another $30,000. Okay. Another. So I said, I got to go speak to Dr. Bauer. So I called him in his office and I said, Dr. Bauer, I'm thinking of switching majors. Uh, but I, you know, I would have to stay in college an extra semester. Would you have just a few minutes to chat with me? And it's like yesterday. He looks at me and says, A few minutes? And you know what I thought he was going to say? Bob, I'm so busy, I'm still marking papers or whatever. I was already to say, okay, okay. A few minutes, you think of switching majors, a whole new career, and you want a few minutes? You need more time than that. 
So I'm going out for lunch. Would you like to join me? Here I am, this poor kid from Brooklyn. You know, my first thought, whatever happens, a free lunch. You know? <laughs> so we go out. I didn't go out to restaurants very much. We go out. I was so nervous because when they gave me the menu, I thought those were the day psychologists would interpret what you ate. I said, if I order meat, will you think I'm a cannibal? I mean, I have no idea. And I'm looking, and this is what happens. Isn't it interesting what you remember? I don't even remember all of, he may have taught this way. As I'm looking at the menu, I look up, it was weird. He starts to lift his tie. And it's like way up here. I'm looking around, I said, maybe this is what they do in nice restaurants. I didn't see anyone else doing it. And then he looks at me, he's frightened, and says, oh, you notice I'm lifting my tie? And I feel like, how can I not notice? You're sitting right in front of me. And looking back, he probably did this to make me feel at ease. He said, I'm ordering soup today. And my wife says, whenever I order soup, I get soup all over my tie. I feel like saying, so what are you going to do? Get it on your shirt instead? But I, I didn't. So he said, I hope you don't mind. And now it looks like a noose. I had to keep him cracking him. Puts it around his neck. He ordered soup. Would anyone in this room like to guess what I ordered? Soup. The same exact soup. I was not taking any chances. So we finished our soup in 20 minutes. And already in the 20 minutes, I was so excited about what he was telling me about his career. He was uh, really, I uh, had a very renowned clinical psychologist and this professor. Half hour, 45 minutes an hour, hour and a half, at two hours he looked at me and he said, uh, you know, I'd love to chat with you more, which always makes you feel good, uh, but I have to go teach a class. And then he looks at me and he, I get emotional telling you, he looks at me and he said, you know, I can't tell you what to do. And I felt like, I really felt like saying, Dr. Bauer, just tell me what to do. If it doesn't work out, at least I can blame you. I kind of and, he, and he looked at me uh, and he said these words. He said, I think you really love psychology. And the very next day I switched majors. And I always wonder if a very renowned psychologist in New York City had not taken two hours with a very anxious, scared undergraduate, would I be here today? And you know, now we have words like paying it forward phrases. I remember even then, many years ago, saying to myself, if ever I have an opportunity to do for any other person what he did for me, I, I would certainly do it. And what I'm gonna to say to all of us, and I'm gonna build on this and also give a certain framework is, what I learned that day, even though at the point, that time I really didn't absorb it all is, the amazing impact that one person could have on the life of others in a certain context. Every one of you in this room have Dr. Bowers in your life. Also, some of us have, like my fifth grade teacher, Public School 48, who even to this day I will not say her name because if I do, I'm afraid she may appear. <laughs> she was the antithesis of Dr. Bowers. She was one I wish she had never spoken to me, but that's a whole other story I'll get into. So, connecting the dots backwards was very important. So, to just quickly fill you in, uh, I switched to psychology, I moved up to Massachusetts, and I got my uh, doctorate at a small liberal arts college in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, Clark University. Any of you, when you got whatever your de degrees you've got, gotten, did any of you, once you got to your degrees, say to yourself, very honestly, I have a degree now, I still don't know what I'm doing. So I get a PhD, they are now calling me doctor. I was more anxious than ever before because people actually expected me to know what I was doing. So I said to my wife, who's very loving and direct, I said, um, you know, even though I have a PhD now, I think I need more training. I told you she could be very direct. She said, what have the last five years of graduate school been about? I'm so glib. I said, preparing me for more training. <laughs> she was easy to convince than my father-in-law. My father-in-law was a New York City police captain who always wore a gun. And I remember, it was actually, police captains always wore their guns, even when they were off duty. So I went to tell him I thought I needed more training. All I could do, I couldn't even focus on his face. I kept looking at the gun. <laughs> 
and uh, I, I, I still remember his comment so clearly said, more training? Do you know what you're truly going to do with your life? And the not so hidden message was, are you ever going to support my daughter? At least I could say, if I go for a postdoctoral fellowship, they do give a stipend. So that at least eased him a little. Anyway, I grew up in Brooklyn, and I had spent, was in New England for five years, and I, I was pretty sure I was coming back to the Boston area. I met a lot of people there. But I said, see a different part of the country. And so I went out and I did my postdoctoral training uh, at the University of Colorado Medical School in Denver. Here again, I'm, I'm sharing all of this with you because I want you to understand how I got to where I am and why I feel so passionate about what I'm sharing with you. Uh, I went out to Colorado for mainly two main things to get more training in, doing psychotherapy and doing psychological testing. But sometimes you just don't know what's going to happen. The first day I'm at the University of Colorado Medical School, they said we have certain electives here. And one of the electives was a therapeutic day program. It was for kids in the Denver schools who could not make it there. These were kids with major behavioral problems and they came to the medical center and they got their education there. And I even love that, <laughs> I'm small as tell you, the name of the program was called the Psychoeducation School. By the way, when I met the kids, they loved it. They would walk around saying, we're psycho, try to educate us. I always thought, maybe it should have been named after some particular person or something. But this too, connecting the dots backwards, was incredible. Because it was the first time there were educators and mental health professionals all sitting together. No one cared what your degree was. You know what they really cared about? Do you care about the kids? And what can you contribute to their well-being? There was no hierarchy. It was incredible to me. And it was at that point that I said, whatever I do in my career, I really want to see the interface between psychology and education. I even gave a talk where I said, some of the best therapists I ever met do not call themselves therapists. They're teachers and they have far more of an impact on the life of a child than I will ever dream of having. So I moved back to Boston for the next three years. I worked in the inner city of Boston, setting up programs for at-risk kids in the Boston schools. I, I really loved it there. I actually had said to my wife, I could see my whole career here. And then came another one of those connecting the dots backwards, which is also why I'm here today. Have you ever found sometimes you cannot predict what's gonna happen in life? I get a call from the head of McLean Hospital. Um, Mark had briefly mentioned McLean. Some of you may know McLean is one of the oldest psychiatric hospitals in the United States. It was founded in 1811. It was designed by Olmsted. Uh, and uh, when I moved to this new campus, who designed, among other things, Central Park. And um, although it was founded in 1811, it ne did not have services for children or adolescents up to the age of 16 until the 1970s. In the 1970s, they said, we have failed to serve one of the most important populations there is, and that is children and adolescents up to the age of 16. They built a whole child and adolescent program. It was the days before managed care. Kids were going to be in the hospital anywhere from two months to two years. And I get a call from the head of McLean. Again, these, some of these images are so clear. And he said, you know, Bob, we're going to need a school here. And we'll certainly have someone who has expertise, you know, in curriculum. But we really wanted someone with both a clinical and educational background. How would you like to apply to become first principal of this school in the psychiatric hospital? I know we have some principals here. I couldn't believe, you know what, I'm listening to this, and you know what I'm thinking? Thank heavens I didn't say it to him. I, my first thought, a uh, principal. I can be the boss. I can run my own program. I was so naive. Anyway, I foolishly applied for the job. They foolishly offered. I foolishly accepted it. The first two months were wonderful. They were the planning phase. I hired my entire staff of teachers and clinicians. I loved it. I said to my wife, I miss the inner city, which I really did, but this new job is a job made in heaven. I said this too quickly. Because do you know what happened after the planning phase? The kids came. <laughs> Have you ever noticed schools are very different without the children they are? <laughs> Especially in a locked door unit of a psychiatric hospital. Now why is this all so important? 
I really, I, 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 I've met a couple of you, but I, I really don't know much about anyone. I don't know if any of you have ever felt burned out, disillusioned, wondering what the heck you're doing, or on and on. Within two months of the kids arriving, I totally burned out emotionally, spiritually, and physically. I don't know if you ever, every morning when I got up, I had a headache and stomach ache. I, I still remember, you know what I tell myself? It's not really you. And I said, well, who the hell is it? I mean, that's it, you. When I would drive to work, it was about a 20, 25 minute drive from where I lived to McLean Hospital. For years, I couldn't even tell people this. I would actually say to myself, oh my God, I gotta go to work. Oh my God, I gotta see those kids. And I would actually say, maybe some will be out sick. And, what are you laughing at? And then I realized there was a locked door unit in a psychiatric hospital. They were always there. <laughs> now, this is something, we don't have time today, it's not an all day workshop, but this is something I'd like you to just think about, or even a small group discuss it. If I could sit down with each one of you, I'd love to ask this question. Of all the experiences you've had as a professional, I know we have staff who all contribute to the school here, so whatever your role is here, I always like to ask, of all the experiences you've had in your role, what have been two or three of the best moments you ever had and what made them so good? And of all the experiences you've had in your role, what have been two or three of the worst and what made them so difficult? And I always like to ask, what did you learn from both? So now I'm gonna tell you why I not only was interested in resilience in kids, but resilience in adults. I'm gonna tell you one of the worst days I ever had and then I promise my talk gets entirely uplifting. Okay, if not, we'll pass out some medication. Okay. <laughs> I got up one morning with a headache and stomach ache, and I really didn't feel like going to work. And I said to my wife, I don't really feel like going to work today. And she said to me, you know, you're, you're the principal of the school. And you know, I thought, I said, so you go. I mean, I don't, I don't you know. So I drove to work, <clears throat> and I don't know if you've ever felt this way. I walked in, I really felt sick. And I said, I can't stay here. And I said, why do you feel so sick? And you know, now I could even smile about it. I realized something. I was not doing a very good job. Not only was I not doing a very good job, the kids were actually getting more angry and more violent than learning anything. And you know what it's like to go to work and feel like you're a failure? So I said to my secretary, I don't feel very good. And I went home and I wrote, at least two thirds of my resignation letter, feeling very depressed. I wrote, by the way, I ripped up the re ripped that letter, uh, else I wouldn't be here today, and I ended up working with McLean for 23 years. Uh, but I had this epiphany, which now is gonna get into some of the key concepts, but you'll understand, again, why I feel so passionate about it. I had this epiphany, which is gonna sound so simple to all of you. I remember going home and said, you know, if I continue to do the same things I've been doing, and my staff continues to do the same thing they've been doing, you can all fill in the next line. The kids are going to continue to do what they're doing. We're waiting for the kids to change, but we're not changing at all. I spent a year, years later, researching and writing a book on how to discipline kids in homes and schools where they would become more <coughs> responsible, respectful, and resilient, rather than more angry and resentful. And you know what I realized? Our forms of discipline were almost abusive. I mean, we threw kids in quiet rooms, we did so much. And so, I did a lot of soul searching, took two mental health days, went back, and little did I know what a courageous staff I had. We changed everything. Instead of looking at what was wrong with kids, we started to look at, I hope this doesn't count corny, at their beauty and their strengths. We started to look at what brought them here, what could we provide that would be different. So now, I'll fast forward five months later. For the first time, we were able to have a visitor to the school. It was a teaching hospital for Harvard Medical School. Certainly, it had to be vetted to be a visitor. And this educational expert observed the school and, and said to me, Bob, I can't believe this is a school in a locked door unit of a psychiatric hospital. And I said, well, why? And, uh, she said, the kids seem to be so respectful and disciplined. And I remember whispering to one of my staff, do you think we're getting better kids? And the staff member smiled and said to me, half of them are the same. The other half are just as difficult. And it was at that moment 
I realized something. That what really changed was the staff's attitude and the strategies they were using. And at that moment I realized what I was learning in that psychiatric hospital school could be used in any school or any setting. And it was at that moment that I really started to feel that what I had been doing had not been working very effectively and these changes were necessary. So connecting the dots backwards, I had this journey which I now want to share with you. So what did I learn and how does it apply to any one of, you know, any one of us? Oh, <laughs> this is what happened. That's what I just told you about. A very key concept in psychology and education these days is mindsets. I'm going to talk to you uh, now about that because what I realized is I had a very negative mindset. You can see the definition I use. There are many definitions. I'm going to have, there's a slide with some of the most prominent mindset theories if you want to do some research about them. I say that mindsets are assumptions and expectations we have for ourselves and others that guide our behavior. They play a powerful role in impacting in all aspects of the climate that is created in schools and how effectively we reach and teach uh, you know, our students. Actually, what I'm going to say now, I hope you all uh, uh, agree with, some may have questions. One of the things I learned is every student, I don't care what their age, when they interact with us, we interact with them, they have a sense of how we feel about ourselves and they certainly have a sense of how we feel about them and our expectations for them. You know, one of the earliest mindset theories I ever read goes back many years. Some of you uh, may know about it. It was conducted by a psychologist at Harvard University. His name was Robert Rosenthal. It was known as the Rosenthal Effect. He wrote then a brilliant book called Pygmalion in the Classroom based on the George Bernard Shaw play and that hit musical. Well, I fail, lady. Get me to the... I can't sing, but I like to at least do three words and, and that. They, don't, they won't even let me lip sync, at, lip sync at home. I think that is really discouraging. <laughs> what did Rosenthal do? And I, by the way, when I was reading it, I really wasn't using the word mindset. He goes into a school district, and at the beginning of the year, he tests kids. He gives them IQ tests, he gives them achievement tests, and then during the year, with the teacher's permission, Rosenthal goes in constantly with his colleagues to observe the testing. But after, uh, observe the uh, teachers and interaction, I should say, but after the testing, the initial testing, Rosenthal sat down with the teachers and he said, I want to tell you, all of you have in this class, and in each class, he didn't quite use the term budding superstar, but that's what I use in my writings, but it's very close, budding superstars. These kids are ready to just really take off. They were very interested in learning. They were interested in the testing. They're very motivated. You're very fortunate to have them. And then he says to them, I am going to tell each of you who the Bunning stars are, Bunning superstars are in your class. So he gives each teacher a list, and many of you know exactly where this is heading. Again, with the teacher's permission, Rosenthal and his colleagues went and constantly observed the teachers. At the end of the year, whether you believe in IQ scores or not, because even as a psychologist, I sometimes wonder what some of them are measuring, the, uh, the budding superstars' IQs went up eight or nine points higher than those who were not. Their achievement scores were higher. They had fewer discipline problems, greater attendance. So Rosenthal, at the end of the year, sat down with the teachers and he went over the data. I was too young to be a part of this, but just in reading some of the material, the teachers basically said, Dr. Rosenthal, your tests were the best predictors of success in school we've ever seen. You predicted, based on your tests back in August or so, which kids were going to thrive, and they did. By the way, you couldn't do this research today. I think it's too deceptive. <laughs> and all of you can guess what happened next. Rosenthal said, well, now I can tell you something. You know the list I gave you? It was a totally random list. A number of the names I put on the list on purpose were kids who seemed most disinterested in learning, least motivated, whatever. You know what this wonderful group of teachers said? But still, it, it, we didn't treat them differently. That's impossible. We treated all the kids the same. They weren't even aware of it. I'm going to give you an example. If a teacher called on a kid in his or her classroom <coughs> and asked a question, <coughs> the kid responded by saying, I, I really don't know the answer. 
in the recesses of the teacher's mind, the teacher's mindset was, if my budding superstar doesn't know, then others don't know. And you know what they would actually, they would say things like, let me just review this again. I mean, within reason. They weren't blaming themselves as much as saying, maybe I have to go over this again. So I'm reading this, I'm saying, well, I think that's good teaching. The same teacher calls on a kid who says, I don't know, but that kid is not on the list of budding superstars. Would anyone in this room, since I've been speaking nonstop now for about 15, 20 minutes, anyone in this room like to hazard a guess how the teacher responded to that kid? Oh, 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 oh. oh let me tell you my style, because you are, I don't, first of all, I never call on anyone. Because I find if you call on someone within two seconds, you've lost your whole audience. Everyone gets very, um, but this is my style. Any person who answers first and answers incorrectly, I do laugh hysterically for 10 minutes. But I get it out of my system, so who has the thickest skin here? So what, what, what do you think? I, I'm, and I want to tell you this, many of the teachers were not even aware they were doing this. Anyone? So you call on a kid, kid says, I don't know, kid's not on the list of budding superstars. What are some of the things the teacher said? Yes. Oh, you go right to the heart of the matter. That's great. And by the way, that took a lot of courage. So you win the $10,000 award for teacher of the year. I, mean, I wish I had that to give you. Uh, some teachers did this. They would actually call on the budding superstar, well, one of the budding superstars says, why don't you help? But, terrible. Puts both kids on the spot. But if the teacher was a little annoyed, teachers actually said this to the students. By the way, we, we discussed that about uh, 15 minutes ago. You please pay closer attention. Or oh, we talked about that yesterday. You know, you really have to pay closer attention. Why would you ever tell a kid who doesn't know an answer? Well, some people are gonna have said to me, you could be very challenging. I'm gonna tell you right now, anything I say to you, I've struggled with and asked myself many times. Why would you ever say to a kid who doesn't know an answer, you've gotta pay closer attention? Or, you know what, we covered this yesterday. Think of it this way. We won't have as much of a chance of a dialogue as I do in, certainly in, in my, uh, you know, all day or week long seminar. But imagine there was a lot of time for questions and one of you asked me a question. And I looked at you and I said, by the way, you know, I happened to cover that 10 minutes ago. Could you try to pay a little closer attention? Let's say we were together for a day, six hours. I'll make this up. Five hours, 58 minutes, there was a pretty positive atmosphere. You know what most of you would remember when you left the room? That one comment. He put a person down. So it's very powerful. You know, I do a lot of work for this group, Learning in the Brain. There was a all-day conference, this was about three, four years ago in New York uh, City. And there was a professor from the Midwest, whose name I'm blocking on. She had, this, she had this question, she wondered this. As she was looking at elementary schools, if a teacher has math anxiety, would it increase the math anxiety of her students or his students? By the way, I'm the next speaker Thank heavens my self-control has improved over the years. I was ready to crack up laughing because all I was thinking about is what is the teacher going to do? Get up in front of the class and say, I have significant math anxiety. I hope it doesn't impact on you. You know what she found? The teachers with the ha highest math anxiety, by the end of the year, the students have the highest math anxiety. They know. You can't hide that. Mindsets and expectations are very powerful. Okay, now I'll tell you, because you're such a lovely group. If any of you knew me, some of you weren't even born yet in the 70s, but any of you knew me when I was principal at school, and this was before things could go viral and you didn't even know, and said, you're having a tough time with the students at your, your hospital school? Tell me about them. <laughs> you know how paranoid I got? Probably at one point I would have said, I think they're out to get me. I think every night they plot on the impatient unit, how to make my life miserable, on and on and on. The kids knew this. So, in the 1990s, I'll just say this quickly because we're going to go into greater detail. I became more and more interested, even in the 80s, but I started formulating. I, I, based on my experiences, I became very interested in this concept of resilience, which is a really very complex concept. I'm not totally simplified. For me, it is really the capacity to bounce back from adversity. Resilience doesn't mean you're not going to face adversity, but it's what we want for ourselves and other, 
uh, with the students we work with <coughs> is that when you face adversity, you have ways of coping with it. And what happened was, as I look back, working in the inner city of Boston, I got very interested in this. How does someone grow up under racism and poverty, and yet you meet them as adults, and they're much more hopeful and optimistic than you would ever dream? Working in a psychiatric hospital, <coughs> excuse me, for as long as I did, unfortunately, a number of the kids and adolescents there had experienced a great deal of trauma, abuse, <coughs> and yet when we did longitudinal studies, I was always impressed some of them exceeded what I even, being an optimistic person, exceeded, a bit, I would say, what they were doing, friendships, whatever, more than I would ever imagine. Why? I've always been, <coughs> been interested in kids who struggle in school. As a matter of fact, if I ever came to Madison during <coughs> school day, I always love to ask kids, I don't care if they're five years old, four years old, 18, it's almost like a Rorschach test. So, general, tell me about school. I, one day I just want to write a book and answers that question. I still remember it was a seven, eight year old boy. He, he, I said, tell me about school. I am convinced based on his answer that he read one of my books before he met me. I said, tell me about school. This was an actual quote. School is the place where my deficits rather than my strengths are highlighted. Who talks like that? <laughs> an adolescent said to me, just like this, going to school every day, Dr. Brooks is like climbing Mount Everest every day without the right equipment and training. And I remember I said, wow. And he looked at me and said, you gonna let me finish? I said, okay. They ask you to do it again at night, they call it homework. <laughs> have you ever wondered why is it some of the kids who you might not have predicted would be doing so nicely in life, good jobs, friendships, whatever, may not have looked that way earlier on. A friend of mine who does a lot of research in resilience, Mark Katz in San Diego, he wrote a book, Children Who Fail at School But Succeeded Life. And why is it some kids that seem to succeed at school do not necessarily do very well in life? And I started saying, as educators, psychologists, parents, one of the most important things we should be thinking about then is what helps kids to be resilient. But I was also, I did some research, and this is a, a finding I want to share with you. I hope you right away can incorporate the first day of school. When I was writing my first book on school climate, and you'll see why I have things like contributory activities, compassion, I gave a questionnaire to 1,500 adults, many in the field of education and mental health. Now I have about 4,500 of the questionnaires. And I asked this question, of all the memories you have of school, what is one of your favorite memories? Something a teacher, school administrator, or school staff said or did that boosted your motivation and your dignity? And you know, one of the most common answers I got, I never expected, and little did I know it was gonna teach me, as you'll hear even more in a little while, it was gonna teach me something that should be part of every school environment, every classroom. One of the, the, one of the first answers I got, most common, was when you were asked to help out. Do you, oh, you know what I mean, I got like this? I remember when a teacher asked me to pass out the milk and straws. I remember when a teacher asked me to tutor a younger child. I remember saying, that's one of the best memories of school? We now know, if you go to my website, how many articles I've written, including elderly people who are actively involved in helping others, even if some of their other habits aren't great and lead longer lives. One of the best ways I ever cut down on bullying and working with schools was when I started asking kids to help out and just use words like help out. You see it all the time. Well, I remember when my grandson Teddy was, he, he was in preschool, he must have been about four years old, so I'd pick him up. I love how he asked, how was school today, Teddy? Teddy says, good day, Grandpa Bobby. I said, what made it a good day? I was the line leader. And I remember, I'm so naive, I said, what is that? He says, I let the line. <laughs> and then he looks at me, he's just like, I could see him, you know, I'm driving, he's in the back seat, I look up, he's a big smile, I said, I hope they let me do it again. <laughs> it's so, it was very powerful. So what I said is, no person can be resilient unless they feel they're making a difference in the life of others. No student will be as motivated unless they feel every day when they come into our schools that they feel they're making a difference. I'm gonna go into this in greater detail because I've been writing a lot about compassion and gratitude. You know what my dream is? 
If I came back, interviewed every kid in the Madison district, and said, what is one thing, one way you think you make a difference in the life of the school, a positive difference? This is my dream. Every kid could tell me at least one thing they do that, make, that makes a difference. And we're gonna look at this more. Because see, this is, I started getting very interested, as you'll see, how do you start creating environments where every child really wants to learn from us? So continue with this, this next slide, and uh, you're going to get, uh, by the way, I had asked Mark afterwards, because I, I always make changes even as I'm going along, and I, uh, I, I will send uh, this, the, this PowerPoint to be distributed. I just wanted to say there's a long history. I already told you Rosenthal, but many of you may know some of these names. I just took some of the most prominent ones probably in this day and age. Carol Dweck's book Mindset and her focus on fixing both mindsets is one of the most prominent, and Angela Duckworth at the University of Pennsylvania's concept of grit. And while I have great respect for these theories, I really feel that some of them do not contain or emphasize enough this. I say many of these theories place very heavy emphasis on achievement. And I say based on my experiences, I felt that equal emphasis should be given to the significance of interpersonal relations <coughs> ships and social emotional variables when we describe mindsets. I am very concerned about the focus and overfocus on mindset theories on achievement. What your grade point is, average, on and on. There's a, a colleague of mine, at some, some of you may know his name, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. His name is Richard Weisbord. He did a very fascinating study, and I wrote an article about this, if you're interested, on my website. He gave a question asked to thousands and thousands of middle and high school students around our country. And he was very concerned about the findings. P kids had to basically rate what is most important in their life. A vast majority of middle and high school students said, that getting good grades was more important than showing caring or compassion. Parents said, but caring and compassion is important. And you know what the kids basically said? If it's so important, how come we spend so much time in the evening on grades and achievement scores and the rest, and not about compassion and caring? And he says in his work, he said, it's disturbing. I don't know where this is gonna go, but we have to look at, at this. So, and I, I, I've spoken, you know, I've presented with Ka uh, Carol Dweck, but I'm just going to give you a few examples. In her book, Mindset, and some of you may have read it, where she talks about fixing growth mindset, there is very little, if any, mention that changing a, a student's mindset from what she calls a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, that a great part of that has to do with the teacher. Uh, you know, you've all heard this in different ways. <clears throat> Kids don't care what you know till they first know you care. You're not going to change kids' mindset if they're sitting there and say, this person doesn't even care. Why should I start changing this? And again, I hope this may be obvious to all of you. You may be sitting there saying it's obvious. <clears throat> but my concern is, if it's so obvious, why is it emphasized in books? Car one of the best-selling books is a book called Grit by Angela Duckworth where she talks about passion and perseverance. But look, this is an actual quote from her book. Having a great coach or teacher matters tremendously, but my theory doesn't address these outside forces. I've been to some schools, I should have asked maybe Mark on it, the, the most prevalent word I see in the hallway is grit. Grit, 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 you gotta have grit. We gotta have kids to have more grit. And somehow what gets lost in that is, but what is our role? What is it, just saying to a kid, you gotta have grit? And we have moved away too much from what I would call, you know, as Mark had mentioned, the whole child. So you'll get all of this, and I, I don't wanna be over, I'm sure Angela, Carol could find fault with my concept of resilient mindset, but in her book, Grit, Duckworth says, it's about the psychology of achievement, because psychology isn't all that matters, it's incomplete. And all I want to do is, I would argue that having a great teacher, coach, mentor, 
Now, anyone, any person who serves in that role is more than about psychology. So now, people have often said to me, okay, you're not thrilled with some of the theories out there. Have you found any theories that you can use from the first day of school to set up classrooms where kids are gonna, are gonna thrive more? And this is now, I wanna get to what I feel we should all be considering. A number of years ago, I read a book that was, I would call transformative for me. The book was by Sean Aker. He was trained at Harvard, he got his doctorate at Harvard, and he's one of the most prominent people in what we call the field of positive psychology. He wrote a book called The Happiness Advantage. I, if you haven't read it, I, I don't get any of his royalties, I would highly recommend it. Uh, the research in that is fascinating, as is the theory. And as I read it, all I could think about was I wish every teacher, every educator, every parent, and I use it when I speak in the business world, read this book. And so what does he say? Why did it have such a powerful impact on me? And I hope it will have on you, because I'm going to get very nitty gritty about uh, some of this now. In his book, Aker says this. He said, we have things backwards too often. Too often we say the following. We say it is success that leads to happiness. And there's truth to that. You know, you get a good grade, you feel happy. You get a hit in the Little League game, you feel happy. <clears throat> but he said, and he has so much research support, that said, the problem is, it's the other way around. And then you'll see the implications. He says it's really happiness leading to success. Now I must tell you, when I first read that, all I could think of, uh, Remember Pharrell Williams' uh, what was song, Be Happy? And all we think of is, should we put smiling faces on every kid's paper? I know, I know we do some of these things. And all I can think about was my granddaughter, Lila, who was Teddy's uh, uh, sister. I, I was, that's why when Mark mentioned I was tech savvy. My grandkids all learned to text before I even knew what texting was. So one day, I get a beep on my phone. I didn't even know what it was. It was a text. It was from Lila. She was all seven at the time. Dear Grandpa Bobby, I love you so much. 50 smiling faces. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I thought she was brilliant. I said to my wife, look how she could do this. My wife said, they're called emojis. I didn't even know they had a name. But look, she still did it. I, and my wife said, you see this little thing on your phone? you could change letters into emojis. I never knew this, so I said, this is neat. So I wrote back, dear Lila, I love you so much too. 60 smiling faces. You have to know my granddaughter Lila. Within literally three seconds, I get back, me too, Grandpa Bobby, 75 smiling. <laughs> At that point, I said, enough is enough here. But I had this feeling of just be happy, whatever. But one of the things was, I said, what is his definition? And you gotta, you gotta realize, I'm always, when I read theories, how, how, do you, how can you apply this the first day of school? How do you apply it if you're seeing a kid in therapy? How do you apply it, how we treat each other as colleagues? And so, as I said, Aker said, it's happiness that precedes success. And his definition was incredible to me. And we'll see the implications for this. He says, happiness is the experience of positive emotions, pleasure combined with deeper feelings of meaning and purpose. You know all I can think about when I read his book? What was the most common, prominent memory I got of kids feeling more motivated and dignified in school? When they were asked to help others. What Aker was saying here was, if you, Maybe he didn't say it quite this way, so I'm going to tell my interpretation. And I'm going to have to f finish the, sentence, the first sentence quickly, so if I stopped, you'd all laugh me out of the room. I'm going to say this. Our first job as educators is not to teach reading or science or math or second grade or first grade. Now, if I stopped there, you'd say, how did Mark ever invite, why did Dan recommend him? I'm going to say this. That is critical. But what Aker would say, based on his first job, is 
how from day one do you create an environment with positive emotions where every kid comes in and feels a sense of purpose and meaning to their education? Because you see, what Aker is saying is the following, and when I get to theory of motivation, I'll have to go into this even more. What Aker is basically saying is this, our first job as educators is right away to create a certain environment where there are positive emotions because then kids are going to be much more receptive to learning from you. This is even before I started finding about, out about some of the brain research. You know, even coming in here, first of all, having dinner with... Oh, oh, that, oh that's feeling... That, don't... <laughs> Yeah, it is a pretty uh, great slide. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> All of a sudden I saw this flash. Oh, you know what's always amazing to me? When people tweet and I'm in the photo, I said, how did they get that photo? What did they see? Okay, I'm sorry. Now that's okay. Take as many as you want. I, I don't care. Um, what I, what, just what I was going to say is, having a chance to meet um, Mark and his wife, listen, and coming in today, and John, are you back there? John right away greeted me and helped to set things up, and I just felt very welcome right away. And several of you came up to say hello. Someone said to me, oh, what are you, insecure? You need people to come up and say hello? Yeah, but have any of you ever been, have any of you ever been the only person you know, you go somewhere? It's very powerful. And then to have a lovely introduction like that, you know, it's very, very powerful. I can understand that. So positive emotions are going. I'm, I'm feeling like you know I, I really want to speak to this group. Do you ever do you ever have to speak to someone where you say I, I don't want to speak to that person? It's very interesting. So Aker's work was fascinating to me. He looked at all different in, you know environments, but then what's, what people have really done? People have started to look at brain. What is the brain doing when there are positive emotions? And as educators, even if we're not into all the brain function, we should understand something. Positive emotions, and I say, which I believe they're housed in a positive relationship, enhance brain development, enable us to think more quickly and creatively, become more skilled at complex analysis and problem solving, and see and invent new ways of doing things. Do you know what he's saying? You set up positive emotions in your classroom where each kid has a purpose, they're going to be much more willing to take risks in your classroom, they're going to be much more creative and whatever. I mean, have any of you ever, ever had a teacher when you were growing up, you were more concerned about looking foolish or being humiliated than learning? It constricts your thing. I mean, your, your whole anxiety is there. But yeah, you think about a teacher, I'll tell you, like John Bauer, my sixth grade teacher after, you know, who, whose name I will never say. You know, when I read the Harry Potter books, Voldemort, whose name you're not supposed to say, but I say it there, all I could think about was my fifth grade teacher. The names that should never be said. Okay. Once in a while I get these loose associations on this. So, think about it this way. Then, I just want to, again, you're going to get these slides, because some of you may want to read some of these books, look at them, or have it, some discussion. Barbara Fredrickson is a psychologist at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She's author of a book called Positivity. Her work really parallels that of Aker. She has this theory called the Broaden and Build Theory of Positive Emotions. And as I say, it's another theory that I view as having major implications for the kind of climate we create in educational and therapeutic endeavors. I'm going through this, I realize, quickly enough. This is what she found. Negative emotions, and it's just what I said before, negative emotions narrow one's thinking and behavior while positive emotions such as joy, contentment, and interest broaden the range of cognitions and behavior. Positive emotions help us to experience seemingly stressful tasks as less threatening and also cope more effectively with stress. The other question that kept coming up, which is going to be the next section, is what helps to create positive emotions? What happens when you interview hundreds and hundreds of kids and ask them what leads to that? What happens when you ask staff? When you come into a school environment, what are the positive emo you know, emotions? And then, just this past April, I did another uh, conference for learning in the brain, 
and I was thrilled because there's someone's work who I greatly admired and we were back-to-back -back keynote speakers and his name is Richard Davidson. And as I say there, he's the founder of the Center for Healthy Minds at the University of Wisconsin and Madison. He, his research is fascinating. Again, I'm not an expert on the brain, but what he found is this. When positive emotions are aroused, it actually activates parts of the brain associated with psychological well-being and lowers levels of cortisol, level, which we know is a stress hormone. But let me show you the application in education. If you go, you could Google this. And I wrote a couple of articles on my website. He, he actually wondered, in a, a preschool level, can you create positive emotions? And if you do, what actually will happen in terms of activating the brain? This is very important because some of you may be familiar with a concept called ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. These are, it's a measure by looking at how many adverse child experiences certain children face. Fortunately, many of us may face one or something, but some kids have five or six. Trauma there. One of the things we know from brain research is that these kids, it actually thwarts the development of the brain. What, this is fascinating. What Davison found was this. Having four-year-old kids, he developed a whole thing called the Kleiner's curriculum. This should go up all the way to high school. Four-year-old kids, when you involve them, one, in learning a little meditation, but two, giving to others a sense of purpose, helping others, it actually is activating parts of the brain that have not been activated before. Do you know the implications for this? What he says is, the brain, there's plasticity in the brain, which means never write off any kid because the brain is always developing. The question is, what do you do in your classroom with a kid who has experienced trauma or is anxious or whatever? What are the things one could start to do so they are gonna be hungry to learn from us? They're gonna be much more willing. So I'm looking at all this, and you have to understand, as a practitioner, I'm always saying, how do you actually apply these things? So I ask, what is one message to be taken from the research of Aker, Fredrickson, and Davidson? The reinforcement of positive emotions, positive relationships, and purpose in educational settings serves as the very foundation for effective teaching strategies and learning. And more and more, I started saying, but what does that really mean? How do we translate it? Now, a question I asked them was this. Every one of us in this room, you and me, we all have mindsets. We have mindsets about why children act the way they do. We even have mindsets why our colleagues act the way they do. We even have mindsets about why we act the way they do. And so I started asking this, and some of this came about because the Dean of Education at a university asked me this question. Said, you say every school has a, a different mindset. You know what's amazing? Every school has a mindset. I've been very blessed in my career. I've visited hundreds of schools around our country and, and the world. If you were with me, some schools I go into, and we'd look at each other after two minutes, you know what we'd say? We've got to get out of here. Other schools I go into, and we were together, you know what we would say to each other? Wouldn't you like to spend a year or two here? So there's a certain mindset that is already built up. So I started saying then, what? Every school has a mindset. When that, when that dean of education said to me, if you were writing a curriculum, what would you say are the most important assumptions teachers must make to truly touch the heart, soul, and spirit of kids? What would you like to see in every teacher? So what I did is I often did. I already interviewed hundreds and hundreds of teachers, not only about teaching, but about their own childhood experiences. And I interviewed more, and I interviewed whoever I could at, at, you know, in, in uh, different schools. And now I want to share you, with you, and again, I bet I'm speaking to the Inverter Choir, I want to share with you what I call the mindset uh, and strategies of effective educators. This first one is what I call the spiritual base of our work. And what I mean by spirituality is it's often closely tied to religion, but it need not be. Spirituality for me is the belief there are things over and above ourselves that add meaning to our lives. 
A spiritual person for me is one when he or she gets up in the morning is thinking already, today may be the day I make a very big difference in the life of another person. It brings purpose and meaning and now we know from research, Davidson's research, it's even activating parts of the brain. So let me explain now this slide. Psychologists started interviewing adults who had overcome great adversity. And uh, I've always like I've always been interested, you know, as I said, in this topic of resilience. And uh, they asked adults who had overcome great adversity and were doing relatively well now by a lot of measures, decent friends, good jobs, whatever. And they said we could have never predicted, based on how you've grown up, that you would be as hopeful and as optimistic as you are today. What do you think was the most important thing in your childhood or adolescence to help you be resilient today? In every study that was ever done, bar none, the first answer was always the same. It sounded so simple, but in a very spiritual way, so we're all here. The number one answer, there was at least one person along the way who truly believed in me and stood by me. Even one person. And in 1988, one of my heroes in the field of psychology, you all would have loved him, he died a few years ago. His name was Julius Siegel. He was a psychologist in Washington, D.C. He wrote a three-page paper. The main quote is on many of my own articles. And this is what he said. In research conducted around the world about children of misfortune, that's any kid who's having problems, basically, the ones who make it have during their childhood or adolescence the presence of what he called the charismatic adult. Now, I must tell you, Sometimes I wish he had not used the word charismatic, because some people have a much different view of charismatic. But his definition is nothing short of poetic. He says a charismatic adult is an adult from whom a child or adolescent gathers strength. And you know how we ended that paragraph? Here's a quick test. This is sentence completion. I bet you're all going to get it. He said, in a surprising number of cases, the charismatic adult in a child's life turns out to be, you all got it, I heard a lot, a teacher. Listen, I hope the kid has many charismatic adults, but you know for some kids, the only moments of sanity, security, and love they may experience is in your presence in a classroom. See, I always love it when teachers say to me, this kid comes from a dysfunctional family. I don't know what the hell that means out of me anymore. And you know what I say to them? So, well, this kid is it. This kid, so you know what I say? So, you have to understand the where they come from. Well, I don't know if I can help. Look, boy, look at what they're coming from. You know what I say? You may have no control over that dysfunctional family. What you have control over is your attitude and response to that kid when he or she is in your classroom. Because there's so many examples. But you know what the problem is? As I go, oh, thank you. Sometimes we don't even know when we served as a charismatic. Adult. I was once speaking at a regional uh, uh, educational conference. There must have, you know, there were maybe 350 people in the room from different schools. All of a sudden, a guy raised his hand very politely. I said, yes. I, I showed the slide. He said, this is really fascinating. I said, thank you. He said, I'm a high school teacher. I've been teaching for 13 years. I think I, I thought he was kidding at first. You'll hear what he said. I've been teaching for 13 years. I think I've been a charismatic adult for many students. That part, I didn't think he was kidding. I said, that's wonderful. And just like this, this is the part I thought he was kidding. Then I realized it wasn't. He looks and says, how come they haven't written to tell me? And you know what? I knew what he meant. We often don't get those notes of appreciation. By the way, you ever feel, if any of you, either in your classroom or if you ever give a talk, you ever feel like you have just lost an audience? All of a sudden, I hear people mumbling. Actually, you know, I can pick up a little. Why did that kid never write to me? I really helped that kid a great deal. So I say, because I had to do something, Oh, a lot of you are upset that you haven't gotten those notes of appreciation from your students. Yeah. Only because I already had gotten to know the audience. Else, I don't know if I could have said this. Some of you may guess what I said. I said, so let me ask you a question. How many of you have wrote to your charismatic teachers to thank them? You, I wish I had a hidden video. You would have thought, I just asked, what has been your greatest sin in life? People put their heads down, oh my God. I hear now, the whole conversation is changing. You know, I really should have written that person. My talk ends, there's like 20 people coming up. They want my forgiveness. I mean, that's what I felt. <laughs> By the way, for the younger people in the room, I won't say what age that is. At the end of this, think of one of your charismatic teachers. 
and write to them today. See what it does for you and see what it does for them. It's a very powerful kind of thing. Uh, uh, you know, that was what I said was uplifting. But you know what a teacher also asked me at one workshop? Bob, if there are charismatic adults, or there's such people as anti-charismatic. And I remember, I said to this teacher, could you please define the term? I, this is why I love giving workshops. She was so expressive. They suck the energy out of you, and they put you down. And you all know who I immediately thought about, my fifth grade teacher. <laughs> so, we don't have time today. If we had a lot of time, if this was an all-day workshop, I would do this now, but do it back in your school, do it at a staff meeting. This is a very powerful exercise, teachers have told me. It gets us to think about the impressions we make. Who is a charismatic educator in your life as a student? What did that person say or do that made him or her a charismatic educator for you? I already told you about Dr. Bauer, Mr. Minato, my sixth grade teacher who followed you know who. I could get, tell you two or three things he said and did that made me love school again. And how many sixth grade, sixth graders have class reunions through high school? because we love Mr. Minato so much, it was all sort of seeing him, but the whole class, the whole class he created. Okay, to make it group therapy, who was an anti-charismatic educator in your life? What did that pay, per, person say or do that made him or her an anti-charismatic educator for you? And then, do you use memories of your teachers to guide what you say and do with students with whom you work today? See, that's what really got to me. What did a teacher say? You know why I didn't like my fifth grade teacher? And I knew I'd never say things like this. Nowadays, I think she's brought up for abuse. My wife tells me not to mimic, but this is how she always added me. Bobby, <coughs> you've got to start using, these are actual quotes. You've got to start using your brains. I heard this all the time. Bobby, you've got to start using your brains. And I'll never forget this day. Nowadays, there would have been a lawsuit, I know. Bobby, I think I know why you're not using your brains. So this was going to be a revelation to me. So I said, why? Maybe it's because you don't have it. <laughs> that teacher would be fired today. But you can see where I grew up. Ma, 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 ma. I'm glad you're confirming that it's not the most appropriate thing to say. <laughs> No, but you know what it was? It was a different time. My parents were immigrants. Two-thirds of my the students' parents were immigrants. You never, you, you never told them. I never told my parents that. You just didn't say these kinds of things. Do you know what that did? The only saving grace was, I think if I didn't have this, I had a number of friends in that classroom. And I found support from them. But imagine if you're a lonely kid in a classroom and a teacher says that. Or, you know, not that terrible. So I say, do you use your own memories to guide what you do today? So then I, I always love it, because now we're going get, to get to the point. OK, Bob, I've had people actually say this. I want to be a charismatic adult. What do I actually say or do? <laughs> one teacher, because I like to get around, one teacher once said to me, what do they look like? I said like you and me, and I, you know, you gotta be careful. One time I was speaking at a mental health agency in Boston, and it was an agency that worked with very challenging children and families, and at the end, I don't even know why I said it. You know, sometimes I said, I said, maybe what all of you should do, because I, I think you're all charismatic adults, why don't you get make t-shirts? It could be the agency's name, but it could say, I am a charismatic adult. People laugh, I forget about it. Two years later, I'm invited to give a follow-up talk. I give the follow-up talk before I'm leaving. The executive director said, Bob, we have a present for you. <laughs> you all know what it's going to be, but you know, this is two years ago. This magnificent t-shirt. I am a charismatic adult. I was so proud I wore it that night at home. <laughs> My wife said, take it off. You know, <laughs> have you ever noticed? You never that way in your own home. Okay. The other issue, before I get to what we're going to do in our classroom starting, when did the kids start actually? Two, okay. I heard 16 different answers. <laughs> Tuesday, next Tuesday, okay. 
I thought someone said today. That's what I said. Today? Or today? Oh, so I did hear today. Okay. Here are two questions. And then we're going to look at some of the answers. I want you to think about this when you meet students. If someone were to interview students after their first or second class of meeting with me, meeting you, and ask them to describe me and what transpired during the class of meeting, what do I hope they would say? Every kid within five minutes, I'm telling you, is going to have words and images to describe you. Just like you know, within 10 minutes, you already had words and images to describe you. Do you know that? Do you know how nerve wracking that is for me? What words would you hope? Instantly, doing this as a staff or a small group is very powerful. What words do you hope they would use? What, but then comes this question. And these are things for I always feel to consider. What do I intentionally say or do during my initial meetings with students, or it could be with parents, or it could be with colleagues with each other. Every, co every one of you has words and images to describe your colleagues so that they will describe me and their experience with me in ways that I hope. It's very interesting. What does that mean? Think about the two or three words you would want students to use to describe you, whether they're four years old, 18. We have youth coaches here. I work with youth coaches. How, what, what words would you hope that your team is to describe you? I have a couple, you'll see, uh, a couple of video clips having to do with sports. And now I want to go over a couple of key aspects of the mindset. As you keep that in mind, this next slide I added probably seven, eight years ago, and I will tell you why. I, I didn't even know I would ever add this, because if we're going to have that positive mindset and positive emotions, it sounds so straightforward to believe that all children from birth want to learn and be successful. And I'll tell you about Robert White in a, in a moment. I'll tell you why I added this slide. It was like the straw that broke the camel's back that it got me to write this. I was asked to consult on a six-year-old boy in Boston who almost from the time he was born had major medical issues. He was a kid who was rushed to Children's Hospital in Boston with pyloric stenosis or projectile vomiting when he was only about three weeks old. In his next five years, he was, as I said, six, this kid had more surgery, he had <coughs> tubes in his ears, he had hernia surgery, he had a medical record that fortunately many of us will not have in a lifetime. So I'm asked to consult, he also has learning problems. They had a, ref a it was basically a summary of his medical record. And what happened at that meeting was striking to me. A teacher was reading his medical record for the first time and she said, oh my God, I didn't realize he's been in the hospital almost as much as he's been out of the hospital. You know, he's had all these medical problems. You know what I thought her next comment was going to be? We've got to go out of our way for this child and family, given what they've been through. You know, what came out next, although she said later when I talked to her about it, she said, well, I didn't mean it quite that way. She said, you know, Bob, she says this in a meeting. It's almost like some kids are born losers. And I said, oh my God, but you know what the good news was there? The good news was this. As angry as I was, I contained myself. And I spoke to her afterwards. And I hope she really learned you never, never say something like that. When she said that, I thought about a psychologist whose work I read in graduate school. He had, he had been at Harvard in the 1950s. At graduate school, it meant a lot to me, but little did I know how much. Robert White basically said this. From birth, from birth within every child is the wish to succeed. He actually called it a drive for effectiveness. He says every child wants to master his or her environment from birth. By the way, we see it all the time. How many of you all raised my hand? Have ever seen a child take his or her first steps? Have you ever seen that? Well, oh, a number of you. What happened? Well, Sometimes you can't avoid it, they're your own kid. <laughs> what happens after they take a couple the first step? They fall. Imagine if there was an adult in the room who said, you know, if you tried a little harder to walk, you wouldn't fall as much. <laughs> you, you laugh at me. Or I always love it when kids start to babble for the first time. They're, they're still incomprehensible, but both the mother and father there, kids say something that's incomprehensible. The father says, did you hear that? 
I think he said Dada. And the mother said, listen more closely, honey. He said, Mama. And there was a speech therapist in the room who said to the kid, if you tried hard to speak clearly, your parents would not be having this disagreement. <laughs> we would say craziness. Well, I'm going to say something now, and I'll preface it by saying I do not believe in censorship. But I wish there were some words that I will never use to describe a student. Because when they're used, not only is it accusatory and judgmental, but based on the brain research, you create a negative atmosphere and it keeps staff from being as creative as they can be. I, I, I could freely say, because I say these all the time, kids should never be described as lazy, unmotivated, doesn't care, words like this. Because once you say that, you're robbing yourself of an opportunity to be very creative. See, if every kid wants to learn from birth, we have to accept that, but then, so I put this slide up, I go to speak to a group of teachers, they challenged me, and rightfully so. One teacher, I'm convinced, was a fly in the wall of my school at McLean Hospital. She said, you say every kid is motivated to learn? I said, well, that's what says from birth. You worked in a psychiatric hospital, you were principal of a school in a psychiatric hospital. Did you have any kids who refused to do their work? At this point, I felt like I was on the witness stand. But you said it very politely. I said, yeah. Did you have any kids, this part of the guy, who threw their books at the teachers? Yeah. Do you have any kids who ripped up their work? Yeah. So she said, how can you stand here and basically say every kid is motivated to learn when you have all this evidence that kids aren't doing their work? That was a great question. And guess what? At that point, I thought about two educators in California, a husband and wife team, their names are Adam and Taylor. You know what they said, basically? We should never say a kid is unmotivated, because you have to be dead not to be motivated. And they said something that was so transformative. They said, when we say a kid is not motivated, what we're really saying is they're not motivated to do what we would like them to do. And they said one of the strongest motivations you will sometimes see in schools is a I just say, why do so many students seem on One of the strongest motivations is avoidance motivation. Now this is even an interesting thing. People avoid. But if Robert White says from birth every kid wants to succeed and master his or her environment, why do people avoid? Well, in my experience, I don't know if you agree with me, I know some kids <coughs> would rather be class clowns and class bullies and not do work at all. Why? Because they feel like they're failures. Some are physically, emotionally exhausted. So once you say a kid is lazy and unmotivated, that stops us. But perhaps we should think this way. Thus, rather than asserting that students are lazy or unmotivated or resistant, we should ask, how do we lessen avoidance motivation in students who use it? What changes should we implement in the strategies we use to lessen it? See, imagine if in that, sometime during the year you have a meeting about a kid who doesn't seem to be doing his or her work. Someone in the room says, I wish this kid would be much, much less lazy. Wouldn't it be great if one of us asked this question? How do you lessen the avoidance motivation? And I'll tell you, when I presented this, three months later I gave a, a talk dealing with challenging students, especially focused on challenging students. And I get an email from the school social worker, Dear Bob, I took your workshop, it was an all-day workshop, I'm dealing with challenging students three months ago, it came just in the nick of time. The very next day, my principal called me in. This is like punishment for taking a workshop. I said, now you know how to deal with challenging students? One workshop. Here is a list of the five students at the school with the worst attendance and behavior problems. Your job is not only to get them in, they must behave. She writes me this long email, she says, my first thought, mission impossible. My next thought was that cartoon you showed of the kid who was being punished by writing the blackboard thousands of times, I'll stop my obsessive compulsive behavior. Remember what he says? It doesn't get any better than this. Because would anyone like to guess what was the main form of punishment for these kids who dislike school? Suspension. Suspension. And she said, why do we do that? And then she said, all I can think about is, how do you overcome a boy's motivation? I want to show you how one school social worker within one week totally redirected the lives of five kids. She called them in. And she said, yesterday the principal gave me a very important job. He's trying to understand why kids want to go to school or don't want to go to school. I thought of it all, all night. It's much too big a job for one person. I need a committee of experts. I checked the records. You five may be very good. 
You know, one of them, I wish I was there. One of them said, we're the best you have. <laughs> now, all of this could seem like a gimmick, right? You said, how are we going to study this? You could do it in Madison. Every kid filled out the five kids a questionnaire. Two, three reasons they really want to be in school. Two, three reasons that, no, no. She said, this is very important. She then arranged for them to give that questionnaire to the superintendent of schools, school board members, teachers, parents, others. Now they have a whole data pool. They write a report. And I loved it. One of the recommendations, do not wait to fifth or sixth grade to address this significant problem. Some kids hate school or before then. And you know what the recommendation was? The ZADHAC committee would become a permanent standing committee meeting every day after school. This is brilliant. Now they have to be in school because they have a committee meeting. But even this could be a gimmick. What did they do during the day? The first grade teacher in that school district sent his or her attendance sheets to the committee. They poured over the attendance sheets. Any first grader was at a certain number of days. Would anyone in this room like to guess who wanted to speak to them about the importance of school? One of these five kids. She said, I've waited three months. What are the of this? In the three months now, one of these kids has been out one day and we have not had one behavior problem. See, for the first time, they felt a sense of purpose. It is a very, very powerful kind of feeling that I want to read to you, I don't mean many things, but I want to read to you one of the most, uh, I, I, I'll say powerful emails I ever got from a, was from a high school teacher. I spoke in his school district, uh, it was an opening day speaker like here, and then he wrote to me several weeks later, he said, Bob, I, I am an English teacher, the, my last class each day is for students where my class may be, quotes, the only traditional class they have. These are the kids who love to cook well, fabricate, and build with their hands. One of my roles actually was to help them to learn to write essays that they might use in terms of applying to colleges or even other vocational schools. I got them started. A week later, I asked to see their essays. They said, don't worry, we're working on them. I said, okay. Second week, I asked to see them. They said, we're working on it. I said, well, I would like to see them. Well, as I looked at them, I, I, I really saw the utter lack of progress and sophistication in their work. I blew it and asked them, what if this is what you've been doing sitting in my room for a couple of weeks, this is all you have to show for it? I clearly embarrassed the class and one red-faced boy quickly shot his hand up, looked at me and said, you don't understand, do you? Writing is hard for us, it's easy for you, but we're not English teachers. But I can change the brakes and rotors on your Jeep in 15 minutes. How long would it take you to do? At this point, I really knew, knew why I had blown it. So when they came in on Monday, there was a 12 inch by 14 inch color photo hanging on the wall of me working on my Jeep. This is a teacher from Maine. His name is Dwayne Morse. The kid said, what is that? I said, well, I had to put new brakes on my Jeep this week. One of them hesitantly said, so how long did it take you? I told him I was so scared to death and it actually took me six hours to do. They tried not to laugh, but a few did snicker. When, they, when the room became quiet, I said that for as long as I was a teacher, that picture would be hanging proudly on my wall. When they asked why, I simply told them that I'd forgotten how hard it is to do something foreign and challenging. I then apologized to them for being an ass and walking or blowing up at them the week before. I'm just reading his words. <laughs> the week before. And I then said to 18 seemingly unmotivated kids, would you be willing to let me help you with your essays? All 18 said yes. Two weeks later, 18 supposedly unmotivated students were extremely proud of the work they had done, and I had learned a wonderful lesson. I will say this, 40 years from now, you find the students in his class, he would be right at the top of the list as a charismatic adult. And if they asked to describe him, they, you know what? He actually apologized to us. He actually showed his vulnerability. He actually accepted us. So the very last part now, if we, if we want to take some of what I've already discussed is, I started asking myself this. As I listened to the questions I got in all my talks, a business leader could say, how do I motivate my staff, you know, or parents? How do I motivate my son or daughter to do this? A lot of questions had to do with motivation. And I started asking, what is, what is my theory of motivation? What leads people to change? And the theory that I most embraced because I think it is so applicable to our schools was really developed by a psychologist at the University of Rochester in New York. His name is Edward D.C. 
DC has spent his whole life looking at motivation. In one of my favorite books, uh, Daniel Pink's book called Drive, DC is prominently mentioned. Uh, and in that book, Daniel Pink summarizes different theories of motivation and looks at the differences between extrinsic and intrinsic. What DC basically says and why it fit in was this. If you go to my website, there are a number of articles summarizing this, because I'm going to go over it, and we could spend hours on this relatively quickly, I, what I call motivating environments. I started asking, how do you create environments in any setting where everyone really wants to begin work closely together with each other? DC's model is this. DC basically, similar to Acre, would almost say this. There I go again. Your first job as educators is not to teach reading, science, math, or whatever. Your first job is really to think about how do you create during those first few days, and but it never stops, an environment where you meet certain needs. He said every student, and I'll say every faculty member comes in a certain needs. How do we meet them? So I remember when I first read DC, I said, what are these needs? This is why I think I'm speaking to the converter choir, but it's nice to have a framework, because when I go into different organizations and different schools, I look at this. What, what should we be thinking about as we create our classrooms? So I always put this first. There's no word of importance. The need to, to belong and feel connected. And I'll tell you why I added welcome. I read an article that, written by a teacher that said, teachers should spend less time going over every rule and regulation of a school and more time asking this, how do I make every student feel welcome in my presence? You know what I decided to do? Again, as I went to different schools and I interviewed students, I asked them this question, what could a teacher, school administrator, or staff member do every morning to help you feel welcome here? I got many answers, but you know what the two most common ones were? It's earth shaking. Greet me by name. And you know what the other one was? Uh, I'll give you a big clue. It's a facial expression. <laughs> Smile. Are some of you mature enough to see the word I use? have been trained at a time when teachers, I made a mistake last year, I said when teachers were told not to smile until Thanksgiving, and there was a teacher in the audience said, I was told till Christmas. Because <laughs> it was seen as a sign of weakness. I was working with a middle school kid, he, and I was going up to the school, I, over, so I asked him to describe his teacher. I always love kids to describe the teachers before I meet them. And he, he said, she'll never smile. I said, why? She can't. I, I said, what do you mean she can't? And then I heard one of the greatest lines in my 40-year career. I think she has paralysis of the mouth. <laughs> By the way, I thought she had paralysis of the mouth. Think about what helps you to feel welcome. And you know, it's not just the kids. How do you welcome each other? How do you welcome new staff? How do you welcome parents? Why would anyone want to be somewhere where they don't feel welcome? Every kid should be known for a positive thing. So it really gets me to think about, how do you welcome? There was a principal who wrote me a month or so after, I was talking, to, uh, last night we were talking to Mark about this. A month or two after I spoke, he said, I've changed only one practice in my school, and I, I, where do you hear this? Discipline problems have dropped, dropped markedly, attendance has gone up. And I'm reading this email, I said, oh my God, what did he do? He said, I realized I wasn't very welcoming. And now I stand in front of the school and every kid who comes in, I shake his or her hand. And soon the teachers saw what I was doing, they started shaking kids' hands. And he said, I feel better, the staff feels better. Now you don't have to necessarily shake hands, but what do you do? It's a very powerful kind of thing. How do you make anyone feel welcome? And I'll tell you this, if any staff don't feel welcome, it's hard for them to help their students feel welcome. So we looked at the need to belong. Uh, a second need is the need for self-determination or autonomy. Uh, basically what this looks at, and DC's theory is called self-determination theory, is the question, why would anyone want to be in an environment or motivate an environment where he or she felt they had no choice? One of the questions I'm gonna ask all of you to think about, and this has to do with administrators, teachers, all the support staff here, is this, two months from now, as you look at the school year, ask this, what choices or decisions have I made about my own job or what I do? Now one of the things, last year I had a teacher in Massachusetts, when I asked that, I wasn't even asking for a response, said, can I answer? I said, well, okay. 
She said, okay, I'll tell you. I feel that everything I do in my classroom is being dictated by someone in the State Department of Education who has not been in the classroom in 30 years. There's actually research to show when people come to work every day and they feel they have no choice or can make no decisions, it actually affects your immune system. But I want to say this to you. Yeah, my book about resilience in adults, I looked at some of this uh, research. Never lose fi f this fact. There may be a lot of things you have no control over, but what every one of us in this room has control over, and I call it in my writings personal control, what every one of us in this room has control over is our response and attitude to things. You have control how you're going to treat your students. And sometimes it's difficult when you're not feeling so good yourself, and you have to be true to yourself. But it's a very powerful kind of thing on that. And you know, there are simple things you can do with students. You, you know one study DC did just to select one? On my website, I have a number of them. He goes into a high school. With one group in the high school, they're given a choice. They're told you can do homework A or B. It, they're basically two assignments, variations on a theme, but the, the, teach, the students are told you should have a choice. Same high school with another group, it was the more typical thing, here's your homework for tonight. Even I, who believe in this, said, well, what do they find? The kids who were given a choice of what homework to do, A or B, not only did more homework, they not only did it more effectively, but this was a fascinating finding. They judged the teachers to be more concerned about their learning because they gave them a choice. Now, not every teacher could do that, but there's plenty of ways. By the way, for the parents in the room, we've learned to give choices, right? Do you want to take a bath first or do your homework first? Do you want to do this first or I kill you? But we find ways of doing this. There's many different ways for kids to have a sense of ownership. Another article on my website looked at research. It was, it was presented in a, in a journal called Teacher Magazine when even starting in kindergarten, kids are invited to attend even five minutes of a parent-teacher conference, they're more motivated to learn and their behavior is better. Isn't that intriguing? There's so much, think about what gives kid a sense of dignity. Think about what choices you have. People are more likely to be motivated to do a task if they feel their voice is being heard. Every one of us in this room, you and me, we just have to figure out this. See, the big mistake I made is, my mindset with the kids in a locked door unit at McLean was, these kids are out of control, I have to tell them exactly what to do. When I got smart, I formed some student council, a student council, I had them, I cut down on vandalism by having them take care of the space, and there were so many things. At the time, was, I did it intuitively, little did I know there was going to be so many theories behind it. The third need, and I'll tell you what I put, is the need to feel competent. DC says, why would anyone want to be in a place where they feel people mainly look at what's wrong with them? And in 1981, and then I'll tell you what this photo is about, I realized I was making a big mistake. Whenever I came into school to discuss a student, the whole session just about was on what is wrong with the kid. When I would meet, meet with parents who came in to see me about their child who was having problems, and guess what? I mainly spoke about what their kid couldn't do. And now, looking back, that was the worst thing. If, if I lived in the Madison area and came, up to the, came in to discuss a kid with you, you would know after 10 minutes of hearing about one or two problems, you know what I would say to all of you? Please tell me what you see as this kid's beauty, their strengths, or in 1981, I started to use a metaphor, their islands of competence. So I spoke at a school where I was talking like this. They invited me back two years later. When I came back, Every kid at the school had drawn his or her eye with competence. They were plastered around the whole lobby. You know what it's like to walk into a school and kids' strengths? Not only that, you can't see, I'm standing in a sandbox. There's really an island there. And that is actually a quote from one of my books. I had no idea this was being done. The teachers used it to teach kids about mindsets and strengths and obstacles to things. One of the funny things is some of the uh, some of the kids were told that I was coming back for a second time. You know, they assumed I hadn't done a very good job the first time, so they were inviting me back to give me a second chance. So the teachers thought this was funny, so they said, write Dr. Brooks notes of encouragement. I know you won't be able to read this, but they are right. I hope you ace it this time. Good luck. I hope you do okay. I hope you get it right for once. Hope you do good, love Juliani. 
Uh, okay, Dan, who, who was at Piscataway, I spoke at Piscataway the same time last year, and then I was invited back uh, at the end of this year to meet with the school administrators. This is what uh, they did. I just wanted to, to uh, show. There, the teachers are up there, everyone. The teachers told me, and the administrators, it was just more joyful. You could do it anywhere. And this, they did a whole videotape, but I don't have time because I want to show you. No, because I want to show you this. This is so simple, and this is what a principal did. He developed a one-page form. What is, anytime they discuss any student, what is the student's islands of competence, list as many as possible. How can you use these islands to help the student learn and feel more dignified? Isn't that a beautiful way of saying it? He can't, I saw him a year later at another conference. He said, just by having this form, it's like everyone was thinking much more positively. You start seeing people in a different way on this. But you know what my dream would be? Every kid at one point, whatever it is, has their shining moment in the school. Just like all of us would want. I know it's 10 o'clock, I just want to take two more minutes because I, I, I want to mention uh, this. Uh, and it, it has to do with something I've been looking a great deal at. As I said before, I think one of the things that works against kids being more competent is the fear of failure. The real fear is humiliation. So let me just uh, quickly tell you something that I've been working with teachers on based on the research of a Gabrielle Utengen who wrote Rethinking Positive Thinking. What she found is this, and it is so intriguing to me, and I've just started working with teachers about this, that when we give assignments or anything, or new material, what she is, and this is true of anything in life, she has a whole, she has developed this research project where she says it is vital to bring up, consider what obstacles may be to learning or any task, and with not having a self-fulfilling prophecy for failure, but then to say to kids, what may be some of the obstacles to learning, what may be some of the obstacles, and then she says, if they occur, how are you gonna handle it? So basically, this is a resilience model. We are gonna face obstacles, but by preparing kids to know there may be obstacles, but then helping them to cope, her results are fascinating. People are less afraid to make mistakes. Now, each of you, you teach different things, whatever, but it is, again, you can think about how do I apply this? How do I share that? How do I share an obstacle I may have had? But the important thing is how we cope with it. And there are a couple of articles on my website, because I'm going over this so quickly, but I've been so intrigued by this, because for years in my therapy work, I would always say to patients, if this doesn't work, what's another backup plan? I always wanted them to have a backup plan. Because too many people are so afraid to take risks, but if, I, if they know there may be obstacles, how do we overcome them, what are they gonna do? And the very last slide, which touches uh, on what I said before, there really is that fourth need. I used to put under islands of competence, and it's this. This is my dream. There'd be a, every kid's name. Next to their name would be what their island of competence is. Next to that would be how are we using it, like that principal said. And next to that would be what is one thing the student does in my classroom or the school what, that they feel he or she is making a positive difference. I, I've seen schools build this in. It's wonderful. Now, I wasn't able to go over to one of my favorite topics on empathy, uh, but a teacher once said, if you don't have a chance to go over empathy, just read this and I'll capture it. So this is my latest thing. It's called Don't Argue With Children. And it really has to do with always think of the child's perspective. A little girl was talking to her teacher about whales. The teacher said it's physically impossible for a whale to swallow a human because even though it's a very large mammal, its throat was very small. The little girl innocently said, but in the Bible it says Jonah was swallowed by a whale. The teacher became irritated and said, one thing I hope you learn is I really don't like students to disagree with me. The little girl was taken aback somewhat, but then happened to utter, she, but when I get to heaven someday, I want to ask Jonah about this. This got the teacher even more angry, and the teacher said, oh yeah, what if Jonah went to hell? The little girl quickly replied, then you'll have to ask him. One has to be very careful, always see how your words impact on a kid. I, I hope there's a lot of food for thought. I hope this leads to discussion. Thank you for having me here. And